Uh, sorry. Zoom is speaking with me. Okay. We at the Holocaust program, Holocaust Studies program at Western Galilee College would like to welcome you to today's event on ordinary Jews and unordinary resistance. And before I start with my introduction, I would kindly like to ask you to put your questions during the lecture, lectures in our chat, because our moderator, Katarzyna Dziebowska, she will read them out later for us. So uh, during the Q&A, which we'll, we will um, have after the three lectures. Now, the year 2023, marked the 80th anniversary of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, as all of you know. The world remembered the Jewish heroes who fought and died in the uprising and who showed the courage of Jewish women, men, and even children who stood up to the German persecutors. Already in 1946, Dr. Meyer Mark Drozetsky, a Holocaust survivor from the Estonian camp system, and a camp physician emphasized the need to widen the definition of resistance when he wrote, and I quote him, was the armed resistance the only single way of Jewish resistance? Um, and should it be the only thing we recount to our children? Or maybe there were other ways of struggle, maybe not so heroic, maybe old fashioned and ineffective that manifested the Jewish people's will to fight back. We must convey these to the next generations and to the non-Jewish world." End quote. Today, the Holocaust Studies program at Western Galilee will exactly do this when we shift the focus to the average and individual Jewish resistors whose acts of courage are little known. We will hear about Jewish agency and agency in the times of genocide and the impact of the Nazi persecution on Jewish individuals all over Europe and specifically in Nazi Germany and Austria during deportations and in Auschwitz-Birkenau. Our guests today challenge the widespread perspective of the passive Jewish victims during the Holocaust and show the heterogeneous and broad variety of dissident behavior of the persecuted. They don't focus on the outstanding phenomena, the fighters in the ghettos or the partisans in the forests. They focus on less known Jews and their day-to-day -day responses and decisions to persecutions, to persecution, whose acts were, until Wolf Gruner's book was published just recently, a larger under a largely under-researched topic of Holocaust scholarship. I had the pleasure to read already uh, Wolf's comprehensive study, and my impression is that it is a fascinating proof for unordinary resistance by ordinary Jews during the Holocaust. And now I have the honor to do introduce to you Professor Wolf Gruner, even though I am quite sure that all of you know him because he's a very, very famous historian. But nevertheless, he holds the Chapel Green Chair in Jewish Studies, is professor of history at the University of Southern California, California in Los Angeles, and the founding director of the USC Don Zeefe Center for Advanced Genocide Research since 2014. He's a specialist in the history of the Holocaust and in comparative genocide studies. He received his PhD in history from the Technical University in Berlin, as well as his habilitation in 2006. Wolf Gruner is an appointed member of the Academic Con Committee of the US Holocaust Memorial Museum, the Executive Committee of the Consortium of Higher Education Centers of Holocaust, Genocide and Human Rights Studies, the International Academic Advisory Board of the Center for the Research on the Holocaust in Germany at Yad Vashem's International Institute for Holocaust Research and the International Advisory Board of the Journal of Genocide Research. His new book, Resistance, How Ordinary Jews Fought Persecution in Hitler's Germany, 
which was, as I mentioned, just recently published by Yale University Press, is written for a wider audience and features the life stories of five Jewish men and women who resisted in different ways against persecution in Nazi Germany. By discussing many of such courageous acts, the book demonstrates the wide range of Jewish resistance in Nazi Germany, challenges the myth of Jewish passivity and illuminates individual Jewish agency during the Holocaust. And now, Wolf, please, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, uh, Verena, and also Boas for the invitation. And one caveat, the book is actually not out yet, so you are ahead of time. Uh, it's coming out next week. Uh, but I'm st still obviously excited about the book, and you will probably notice this in my talk, um, which is uh, in a way giving you a, a little bit of an insight into uh, the topic of the book, but also the structure. So let me start with first introducing you to one story of a young Jewish boy in Frankfurt. And then I will uh, try to kind of explain why stories like his were, uh, are mainly forgotten or not part of our regular kind of Holocaust history. And then I will share some details about kind of types of individual resistance um, in Nazi Germany and Austria. So let me start with the first kind of story of Hans Oppenheimer. Uh, at the end of the year 1940, so that means during the war, one year before the mass deportation started, Hans Oppenheimer left his four-story apartment house in Frankfurt. It was pitch black outside because there was a brownout uh, because of the Allied air raids. Uh, when he stepped out of the door, it took a moment uh, for his eyes to adjust to the darkness, and then he slowly moved away from his home. He knew he was 17 years old at the time, that he was not supposed to be outside because there was a curfew for Jews in place for more than a full year at this point. Every night, he broke the curfew and anxiously waited for the Allied bombers to attack Frankfurt. When the sirens started to blare and explosions could be heard, he rushed to the next fire alarm post and pulled the handle. The alarm bell rang. And this was the plan he had decided uh, some weeks ago, uh, earlier uh, to divert the firefighters in Frankfurt from actual bombing sites. So how did uh, the 17 year old Jewish uh, uh, teenager to get to this decision? He was the firstborn son of a merchant uh, named Sigmund and uh, his father sold sewing accessories to tailors in Frankfurt. They had a good life. Uh, they lived in an apartment building on Wittelsbacher Allee in Frankfurt, which is an imposing boulevard in Frankfurt's Ost End, where many Jewish families lived at the time. Um, after he graduated from elementary school in 1933, he, uh, his parents enrolled him in one of the most famous Jewish schools in Frankfurt, the Philanthropic, founded by the Rothschild family. However, since 1933, since this time, uh, national and municipal policies had made life unbearable in Frankfurt for Jewish families. And this was the second largest Jewish population in Germany. Already in March 1933, the new Nazi mayor cut business ties uh, to Jewish uh, entrepreneurs. And then later, Frankfurt was often uh, very uh, kind of or, uh, was taking initiative roles in discriminating against uh, parts of the Jewish population. For example, in 1936, Frankfurt was one of the first cities to reduce welfare benefits for poor Jews. After he graduated from middle school with good grades, Hans decided in 1937 that he actually wanted to start an apprenticeship uh, for two reasons. One was uh, uh, kind of short term, he wanted to support his family because his father has lost his business and uh, uh, the, the family depended on welfare, which was just re reduced, as I uh, uh, told you. And then long term, he wanted to acquire skills to uh, kind of uh, make a living uh, abroad, to emigrate uh, and leave Germany behind. The Jewish vocational school, which was established in an abandoned factory in 1936, trained teenagers as locksmiths, carpenters, and gardeners. 
This improved, as you all know, their chances of immigration to Palestine, the United States, but also Latin American countries. After finishing the apprenticeship, Hans registered at the Frankfurt Labor Office in order to find work. In the spring of 1939, the Frankfurt Labor Office sent the 16-year-old Hans Oppenheimer to a newly established labor camp for Jews almost 70 miles away from his hometown. This camp was part of an early forced labor group program introduced after the November program. Um, and uh, during the summer of 1939, already 20,000 Jewish males uh, kind of toiled as forced laborers at road constructions, uh, at, uh, for street cleaning and also garbage removal. A year after this first labor camp, the Frankfurt Labor put, uh, Office put him to another uh, forced labor camp for Jews in Kalkheim Taunus. And this uh, uh, was under especially uh, difficult conditions because the mayor of the town uh, who established this camp harbored deep anti-Semitic feelings and uh, ordered beatings of the Jewish forced labor. And remember, this was all before the war even started. Uh, and the, uh, the forced labor conditions were so horrible that one of the labor, uh, male uh, laborers committed suicide in the camp. So I think because of these experiences, Hans Oppenheimer, when he came back from the labor camp to Frankfurt, decided to do something against the Nazis. And this is uh, why I think that he started to set off these wrong fire alarms. And he did this, this, uh, he did this not only once, but uh, over a dozen times. Uh, however, unfortunately, he was using only three locations and all were very close to his home. And so the Gestapo uh, had a, not a hard time to actually uh, uh, establish a trap and uh, 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 catching him red-handed. So in April 1941, the main prosecutor in Frankfurt charged Hans with several felonies. They could not prove treason, uh, but uh, they uh, wanted to charge him for the sabotaging of the war effort. And the indictment uh, emphasized that Hans Oppenheimer, who was only still just turning 18, um, that he was a full Jew. So this was emphasized in the indictment. And then that the Gestapo, uh, during their interrogation, kind of characterized Hans as an unstable, lazy and dishonest human being who was eager to destroy things. Excuse me, Wolf, you yeah. wanted to share a PowerPoint with us. Later, later. Ah, Let me just, okay. just finish with the stories, then I come uh, with the PowerPoint. I just want to uh, that everybody focuses on this uh, really kind of amazing story. Um, so when... Um, when he was put on trial, uh, he was charged with uh, exactly nine false fire alarms. These were the only ones he admitted to the Gestapo under interrogation. However, the prosecutor suspected that he was actually responsible for more than 40 wrong fire alarms because in his neighborhood, uh, there were 44 false alarms reported during the fall of 1940 after his arrival or return back to Frankfurt. And this series ended after his arrest. Uh, so, but they could not prove this. And so in May, 1941, the Frankfurt Special Court punished Hans with three years in prison for being a public vermin, uh, sabotaging the war effort. He was brought to a small prison and the, uh, held from the first day in solitary confinement, which took a big toll on, his, uh, on him psychologically, but also physically. However, still in prison, he didn't back down and uh, continuously protested against maltreatment, maltreatment by the prisoner, warden and the guards. When his parents in a letter which was confiscate, confiscated asked him uh, or begged him to change his behavior so that to kind of alleviate these conditions, he wrote that thinking about his life uh, would make him crazy. And he told in the letter to uh, his parents, Quote, you know best that I never had a chance to even visit a cinema, a theater, or a cabaret. So he was getting extremely depressed, depressed and this led to two attempts uh, uh, to taking his own life. Uh, I don't know if I can say, fortunately, he was not successful because uh, 
uh, after the second attempt following an agreement between the Reich Minister of Justice and the head of the SS, Heinrich Himmler, he was, as other Jewish prisoners or prison inmates, uh, deported to Auschwitz uh, at the end of 1942. Because of his weakened state, he only uh, survived several days there and uh, his death was recorded on uh, January 30th, 1943, uh, a few days after he turned 20 years uh, old. So what does this kind of story of Hans Oppenheimer reveal about the individual responses of Jews towards Nazi persecution? And I think now I'm kind of trying to get the PowerPoint running. Let me see. Can you see it? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Then just put it a full screen. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so during the Third Reich, um, we noticed, um, and many historians noticed that Nazis complained uh, endless times. Uh, about the so-called impudent Jews. For example, in March 1935, the Gestapo in Aachen reported, quote, the number of Jews who had sent letters and protested in person have, has become quite numerous and in their tone often impudent, end of quote. Still during the war, the Reich Main Security Office emphasized that it had received informations um, uh, about the impudent uh, but just hold on. Uh, about the impudent attitude of Jews from various corners of the Reich. And histo historians, and including myself, we usually understood these kind of frequent mentions of the impudent behavior as a sole trope to kind of justify new harsher anti Jewish measures. Yet this kind of trope of the impudent Jew was not just rhetoric, as we can learn from one report in Berlin. In July 1935, the Gestapo emphasized that Jews were born with disrespect for state authority. We know that it is during the same month in Berlin, the Gestapo arrested more than 100 Jews for offenses against the German state and the Nazi party. Very similar, later during the war, the Gestapo in Berlin and Vienna every month uh, arrested dozens and dozens of Jews for political, so-called political offenses. In the fall of 1942, around 1,200 Jewish men and women served prison sentences for political and criminal offenses. During the last decade, my research revealed that hundreds and hundreds of Jews uh, did resist Nazi persecution. My research strongly challenges, as already was mentioned, that Jews in general, but particularly German Jews, did not resist the terrors of the Third Reich. The traditional perception of their passivity had been based on two main reasons. One, I think, is that we understood resistance very narrowly as a group and armed resistance. And the second reason is that uh, previously historians also dealt with a very limited source base for their research. And as many of you know, since 1945, resistance was discussed uh, among survivors, but also among scholars. And especially in Israel, uh, scholars early emphasized uh, the importance of day-to-day -day resistance. But still, this if we look at kind of how academia uh, kind of understands resistance or Jewish resistance during the Holocaust today, it is still kind of limited uh, to organized and armed resistance, and then mostly uh, occurring in uh, the Eastern occupied territories and not in Germany proper. So a systematic evaluation of individual Jewish resistance is missing in most uh, Holocaust narratives. And even those who focus on the integration of Jewish voices like the widely acclaimed works of so Friedländer. So what I try to do in my uh, book is to broaden the concept of resistance by reviving uh, existing methodological approaches. And I was happy that Verena already mentioned Meir Dworjewski, who kind of already in the 1950s uh, kind of uh, vouched for the uh, broadening of this uh, definition, but also the Australian historian Konrad Kwit and the East German survivor Helmut Eschwege. They all kind of 
try to open up this definition, including kind of non-conformity, protest, and defiance. And interestingly, similar ideas about resistance were raised uh, in very different contexts by, for example, the anthropologist James Scott or scholars working on uh, US slavery. So based on these ideas, I did a very kind of simple thing. I just added to uh, Yehuda Bauer's widely used uh, definition um, one word, as you can see here in the PowerPoint, and this is individual. So I kept his definition, which is widely cited, and just added this uh, one word. And I think, in my view, this broader conceptual approach now does qualify disobeying laws or overall protest as resistance. And I think this is especially justified since, in contrast to other German populations, Jews were exposed to racial persecution and special legislation. So when we use this broader definition, then just looking at photographs, we uh, this changes our whole kind of perspective. So if you look at this uh, photograph, uh, it is widely used as an illustration of the first wave of terror of the stormtroopers in 1933. But if you look closer, you see that uh, there, uh, Michael Siegel, who was a lawyer in Munich, uh, kind of carried a sign saying, I will, will never complain at the police any, um, anymore. So he was trying to defend a Jewish client at the police station who was illegally arrested. Or this is a uh, image which I usually use in class to um, highlight the initial role, uh, initiative role of municipalities. This is a local uh, entrance of a public swimming pool. But under this different perspective, look at the picture and look at the body, body language of this woman. So she is uh, not only saying, um, I'm not obeying to these rules, which are kind of imposed on me, but it's also, she lets somebody take the picture of it. And similar is uh, uh, this uh, picture where you see that the Jewish family is taking a picture kind of next to one of the most uh, horrible anti-Semitic uh, slogans uh, painted on their on the wall of their house. And this is my favorite and also uh, kind of favorite photo. This is Lizzie Rosenfeld uh, from Vienna who sits as a Jewish woman on a bench uh, only allowed for Aryans. And not only is she sitting there and also have, has this really kind of confident pose she also lets somebody take a picture and then later smuggles the negative out of Germany when she, uh, uh, when, uh, she was able to emigrate to the United States. And another sign of uh, kind of this kind of visual defiance, uh, so to speak, is uh, our photographs uh, documenting crimes and uh, taken by Jews. So here, this is a photograph after uh, the program of November, documenting the destruction of a private home. So what I think is not, uh, uh, is, uh, as I said, the, uh, the concept needs to, needs to be changed. But the second reason uh, for this kind of limited access to these stories was uh, kind of uh, that we focused uh, a lot on either Nazi reports uh, or diaries and sometimes memoirs in our kind of uh, attempt to analyze uh, Jewish attitudes. However, in my uh, work, I kind of uh, pursued a microhistorical approach and over 12 years, I kind of uh, harvested documents from dozens of local municipal archives like Berlin, Hamburg, Munich, Dresden, Frankfurt, Vienna, but also uh, Yad Vashem and uh, the Holocaust Museum archives. Uh, and in addition to this, to these mainly police records and also court records, I introduced also uh, material from uh, the uh, vis visual history archive at the USC Shaw Foundation, where a lot of the people speak about this kind of resistance, or do they don't kind of understand it as resistance. So uh, this is also part of my source uh, book. So let me kind of spend the rest of my time to talk a little bit about in which ways um, Jews 
uh, resisted Hitler's persecution in Germany. And this is in my uh, book kind of um, in a way structured uh, in uh, five chapters, each is one story as was already mentioned, but they are representative for one type of resistance. So each chapter kind of highlights one form of resistance, as you can see, contesting Nazi propaganda, all protest, written protest, disobeying anti-Jewish laws and restrictions, and then at the end, physical self-defense. So let me share briefly a little bit about uh, contesting Nazi propaganda, uh, just one case. Uh, and this is um, already in the 1933, many uh, Jews were arrested because they besmeared displays of anti-Jewish newspapers, they destroyed Nazi flags, they ripped down uh, anti-Jewish posters. And uh, one in one case, David Bornstein, he uh, in 1936, tried to destroy the swastika on the public bus in Frankfurt. Here you can see the Gestapo photo of uh, the scratches on the swastika on this public bus. Um, and here is kind of a photograph of an historical reenactment because the man holding the cane uh, is actually is not uh, David Bornstein. It's the uh, Gestapo officer uh, kind of uh, uh, pretending to be David Bornstein. So David Bornstein uh, was uh, denunciated by a bus conductor and then he uh, was punished for the scratches with five weeks in jail. Uh, this immediately kind of when he was uh, released from prison, he immediately uh, left Germany uh, and settled in Palestine with his wife and his daughter. So other uh, parts uh, uh, of the book are talking about all protests. Um, most of these uh, uh, Jew uh, Jewish women and men were kind of arrested under the law uh, against treacherous attacks on the state and the Nazi party. And uh, a lot of those uh, kind of were complaints in public or critique and protest, uh, like for example, Henriette Schaefer, who talked on the morning um, um, uh, of the, uh, after the program uh, in Frankfurt, uh, in front of kind of um, witnesses, as she said, quote, um, about the Kristallnacht, this is not the people, but the government. They are all blackguards, scams, and criminals. Hitler is the biggest bandit. If I could, I would poison him all, end of quote. She received six months in prison for this short comment about uh, the program. And here is Gabriele Reich, just to illustrate that uh, this happened also during the war. She was uh, kind of uh, arrested and got also several months in prison for insulting Hitler in public. Similar, we have a uh, uh, written protest. We find uh, tons of petitions and they are often overlooked, but I think we can see if we look closer that they actually not only try to uh, kind of get exceptions from certain uh, uh, laws, but also to claim their place at or reclaim their place as citizens, taxpayers, and uh, Germans uh, in these petitions. But we also have a lot of anonymous leaflets uh, with, with uh, protest against the per, uh, persecution, like this one, where uh, in 1935, uh, an anonymous uh, writer uh, uh, writes on a leaflet, I quote, Germany is a cultural disgrace today. I'm a German Jew and loyal to the emperor. In fact, the Germans should expel the foreigner Hitler. Down with Hitler. End of quote. So, the last story I want to share because I run out of time is uh, of a 63 year old uh, um, former real estate broker who in 1941, after the uh, uh, kind of introduction of the Yellow Star, was so upset uh, about these anti-Jewish regulations that he sent out anonymous postcard where he put these kind of Hitler stamps on and then he wrote about them um, uh, comments and, for example, like the eternal mass murderer Hitler, disgusting, uh, or the murderer of five million, which was already almost prophetic uh, at this uh, point in 1941. So uh, the other uh, parts I already told you. So um, because out of, uh, I'm running out of time, I want to just kind of wrap up and 
say that most of the cases I found are only the tip of the iceberg because uh, in my capacity, I was only able to uh, look at certain kind of local archives. There are many more archives still to search. And then on top of this, many uh, of the uh, incidences of kind of uh, protest or resistance when didn't leave traces, which we know from, for example, testimonies of the Shaw Foundation, where people tell us about these stories, but they, uh, they were never arrested, they were never denunciated. So what I think is uh, important is to appreciate and commemorate these courageous efforts. France, Belgium, and the Netherlands alone. There are significant differences between the countries concerning the numbers of escapes, but for time constraints, I will not focus on that today. Um, the deputies who were willing to flee used every means possible to smuggle tools and other objects into the trains in order to cut into the carriage walls, tear away planks from the walls or flooring, and bend or saw through the bars in front of the hatches in order to attempt an escape. So those deciding to flee always attempted to escape from deportation trains before they crossed the German border because all the trains from Western Europe had to um, pass Germany, the German territory. So it was always an aim to, um, to, uh, to uh, jump before the border. Escapes on German territory were regarded as too dangerous due to the presumed antagonism of the German population. Some escapes were planned long in advance, others were spontaneous. Anyone daring to jump from a carriage was often hit by the train and crushed, while others were injured by, fall, by the fall from the fast moving train and arrested again. Most of them died because the teams of guards were merciless in their use of firearms. Two aspects emerged during the research work. The first aspect of differing numbers of escapes in the three countries begs the question of conditional escape factors. How can the outlined figures, figures on the relevant deportation quotas and escapes be explained? which external conditions led to the decision to escape from the carriages or not to do so. The second aspect, which I was um, doing research on, concerns the, concerns the situation inside the carriages in the case of attempted escapes. Which social dynamics did the escape attempts cause? What encouraged and what hindered escapes? which arguments and strategies were used. Today, I will only point out some of the results because uh, otherwise it would be too long. So um, I also will use an example uh, to, um, to demonstrate um, the, the results of my uh, research. So let us take a closer look at the example of a group of men who jumped from a train from Drancy, the main detention camp in France, to Auschwitz in order to identify some of those conditions. The so-called tunnel diggers were a group of around 40 men who planned a mass escape from internment camp in Drancy, a suburb of Paris. The secretly dug tunnel was intended to end outside the camp and allow all the camp detainees to flee. Before their arrest, many of the tunnel diggers had been active in various resistance groups, especially in the communist migrant organization, Front Tireur et Partisan, Main d'Oeuvre Immigré, which, um, which was um, the exile structure of communist parties in France. Um, most of them were migrants, and so their plan was to dig a tunnel, to dig a tunnel that goes uh, from the camp um, outside, and so all the detainees de de can flee in, in the night. This was the plan. In September 1943, work began in difficult conditions. Shortly before it was completed, the tunnel diggers were betrayed and put on the next deportation train. 
After the train departed, two of the tunnel diggers began their unscrewing and sawing work to open up the vent in order to jump from the train later in the darkness when the train was traveling slowly around a corner. Some other prisoners initially tried to prevent them from fleeing. Um, the survivors reported that they almost lost their sanity out of fear of the threatened consequences of being shot for the escape of some people in the freight car. But the tunnel diggers were a strong group that could prevail against the others, and they tried to, um, could, to convince people in the carriage to, to also uh, take the opportunity to, to jump, and some did. Among them were the Hanshu brothers. After the jump, Louis Hanshu opened a seam on his jacket into which he had soon a banknote after his arrest. That allowed the two brothers to buy tickets from Bar-le-Duc to Paris um, the next morning. They knew that both had forged ID papers waiting for them uh, there because they both had been active members of the communist um, MOE, which I mentioned before. Uh, another of the tunnel diggers, uh, Serge Boudet, looking back, uh, summed up, we showed that Jews can defend themselves all the also because we survived all that. I would like to use the presented case to demonstrate some preconditions, strategies and behavioral patterns for achieving or preventing escapes that were also effective in the escapes and attempted escapes in France, Belgium and the Netherlands that I have recorded during my research project. So I will talk about uh, escape factors. Um, which I identified. One factor is the group status of the Jewish population in the three countries. While in the Netherlands, a large proportion of the Jewish population was long established and assimilated, in Belgium, only 5% of the Jewish population had Belgian citizen citizenship. The other 95 had mostly only immigrated shortly before often from Eastern European countries. The situation was similar, pretty similar in France. In addition to economic reasons, above all anti-Semitic discrimination and persecution in their countries of origin were the reason for emigrating, um, presumably due to that recent persecution experience, this group was more likely to be aware of danger to their lives through anti-Semitic anti-Semitism than Jews who were assimilated at the time. As a result of their persecution experience, right from the beginning, they were extremely suspicious of the supposed reason for deportation, namely labor in the East. Another factor was the organization and networks. Before their arrest, many uh, jumpers, uh, which I for them here, and France and Belgium had been active in resistance groups that had emerged from left-wing Zionist, socialist, social democratic, and communist inter interest groups among Jews, Jewish migrants. They were also networked due to their organization. They spread knowledge of their impending fate and provided help after an escape, for instance, with false ID papers, and hideouts, as the example of the Hanshu brothers showed. Since they knew exactly that forged papers were waiting for them in Paris, they um, dared to jump. The realistic hope of support after jumping also probably increased readiness to jump, uh, as I've seen in other cases. Significantly, gender was another factor. Many more men jumped than women. I presume two main reasons for that. Women were most likely to assume caring responsibilities than men. It is also possible that men and women had different confidence in their ability to survive such a jump without serious injury. In this way, gender-specific socialization was presumably at least a double, double hindrance for women. 
Another factor I would like to stress is the widespread reporting of the mass extermination of Jews in German-occupied Eastern Europe. In the second half of 1942, there were an increasing number of reports on the extermination of the Jews in the East, as well as reports that others had already managed to jump from the train. From France and Belgium underground papers and flyers have survived, that have survived the um, report on successful escapes calling upon people to do the same. The Comité de Défense des Juifs en Belgique, the Defense Committee of the Jews in Belgium, a group of Jewish communists and left-wing Jewish Zionists published the clandestine newspaper Le Flambeau, um, the flame in English. In March 1943, it included a report on Maya Tabakman, a train refugee. He wrote, I am an escapee. The 19th deportation trains, train that was meant to take me to Poland is traveling at 60 kilometers an hour. The doors are closed and every five minutes the route and the train are lit by floodlights. The Nazi deportation has become reality and is synonymous with death. I decide to flee. There is the lowered window of the lower carriage door. And with one leap, I land on the cold earth. I remain lying there stretched out until the dawn. I feel a terrible pain in my left arm. With a broken arm, I return home after my escape. Am I an exception? No. After every departure, dozens of deputies put up resistance against us. In fact, from autumn and winter 1942 and 3, in Belgium and France, the number of escapes rose so significantly that sometimes people were locked in carriages without any clothing or shoes, even in winter, or were specially marked or guarded inside the carriages in order to prevent escapes. Now I will talk briefly about the situation inside, inside the carriages when someone intended to escape. Generally, the other prisoners reacted when it became known that someone was trying to escape. Only few records refer to indifference or apathy. The reaction ranged from heated discussions and arguments to the use of physical force. There were various factors that influenced attempting to prevent an escape or making it easier for others to go through with their plans. The following examples demonstrate patterns and reactions aimed to prevent at preventing escape attempts. Applying moral pressure was a way to, of preventing escapes. According to some reports, the carriage elders and other prisoners try to prevent others from fleeing by referring to their moral responsibility towards other deputies. There's a great deal of evidence to suggest that the carriage elders, um, so-called Waggonführer, were held hostage by the Germans, as described by Ellie A. Cohen. Cohen was deported from Westerbork to Auschwitz together with his wife, his son, and his parents-in-law on September 14, 1943. He wrote as follows on the condition on the train. The atmosphere in the train, difficult to describe. One man was put in charge as the Waggonführer. All these Waggonführers had to report to the Obersturmführer sometimes before we left. Ours came back and said, boys, I have been appointed Waggonführer and I've been told that if as much as one of you escapes, it will cost me my, my life. It was once more an appeal to our solidarity. Everyone thought, ought you to escape when it can cost that man his life? 
Ali A. Cohen highlights the moral dilemma in which many of those who intended to flee found themselves. Another key factor in deciding whether to jump from the train or not will have been whether loved ones or people requiring help were also in the carriage, whom one did not wish to leave behind. Several cases show that people who wanted to flee tried to convince their relatives to join them. The colony born Rudolf Schmitz reports in the following quote that he tried to convince his wife to jump with him from the 19th deportation train from Mechelen in January 1943. I, I quote, but she doesn't want to, she's afraid. Meanwhile, 11 people leave our compartment, including a man with a child on his arm. I get my wife and show her how easy it is. The train is traveling slowly and stops from time to time. The Belgian train driver is probably simulating a fault. I don't want to jump before my wife has managed it. So the journey slowly drags on through the night. I think of our eight year marriage, think of the devilish SS will separate me from my wife and think of my three children whom I have hidden in a monastery in Belgium. I want to see them again. So I decide to jump alone. I throw my rucksack out of the window, kneel on the window frame, ready to jump. When my wife realizes that I'm determined to do so, she grabs my leg and begs, don't leave me alone. I answer that she should follow me. She doesn't come, however, I jump. Maybe the strongest factor that led to the success of such attempts was collective action as a group. Some reports suggest that when members of an already existent group or resistance group planned together escapes, other people in the carriages did not dare to enter into a conflict with them in face of the group's determination. We have seen this in the case of the tunnel diggers. So I will, um, uh, in the last um, few sentences that I will um, uh, talk about, um, I will um, make some um, notes on how do escapes from deportation trains fit into Jewish resistance, because this is uh, um, the title of the panel in a way. Um, I did an interview with Regine Kroschmal, a woman that jumped from the train, from the 20th uh, deportation train some years ago in Belgium. And I asked her if she felt that escaping from the train was resistance. And she replied, anything you can do against an enemy who is fighting life, you have to do. She decided that it was most important to escape and to continue her fight against the German occupiers as a member of the resistance group Travail Allemand. The same group, by the way, uh, in which Jean Amery um, was active in Belgium. Other jumpers also understood the leap from the deportation train as a politically resistant act. The survivor, Josef Silber, describes them as Jewish revolts against deportation. This was a quote. Um, in his above mentioned report, Maya Tabakman wrote that to flee meant to resist death. If we take the definition of Hage Adler as a basis, according to which it counts as fight against the so-called Endlösung to withdraw Jews from the grasp of the Reichssicherheitshauptamt and his helpers, escapes from trains are part of the Jewish resistance. Since any survival strategy of Jews was diametrically opposed to the Nazi um, race ideology master plan to murder all Jews in Europe, escapes from deportation trains belong to Jewish resistance. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Franz Aki, for uh, such a moving uh, presentation. And um, there are many questions in the chat. 
but uh, we will uh, save them for later, for the end of our panel. And now I'd like to present our next speaker for today's session, Jonathan Lenz. And um, he is an advanced doctoral candidate in, in history and Jewish studies at Indiana University, Bloomington. Uh, his thesis writes a history of the so-called Birkenau Boys, a group of 89 Jewish child survivors, survivors from Auschwitz-Birkenau. Jonathan's research centers on the intersection between children's history, daily life in the Nazi camps, and Holocaust memory. In the past academic year, Jonathan was a claims conference Saul Kagan Fellow in Advanced Shoah Studies and a junior fellow in the Institute for Contemporary History in Munich. In 2023-2024, Jonathan will be in a Gerda Henkel PhD scholarship. And Jonathan, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Katarzyna, and to uh, Verena for organizing. I will try to see if I can manage to share a screen. Um, so let's see here. It looks like it doesn't want me to share a screen, but that's okay. Uh, I don't need to. I can do it the old-fashioned way. Um, so uh, today I want to talk about one of the more, um, in my opinion at least, unknown events in the history of the Holocaust, the staging of Snow White and the Seven Dwarves in the middle of Auschwitz-Birkenau. A 1938 Academy Award winner, the story of a young princess who is mistreated by her evil stepmother and later rescued by a handsome prince is viewed by children around the world to this day. The film premiered in New York and London to rave reviews. Yet there was another premiere of Snow White that was unreported in the media. In February of 1944, child prisoners in Birkenau put on their own performance of this award-winning film with costumes, a set design, and a lengthy script while the SS murdered Jews from Western Europe just a few hundred meters away. Even at the Holocaust's murderous peak in Birkenau, Jewish ch child prisoners reenacted Love's First Kiss. So what I wanna do tonight is using Snow White as sort of a way into these questions of resistance. I want to um, sort of discuss and, and, and examine how this hit production in Birkenau can tell us something new about Jewish communal life, uh, children's lives, and resistance at the heart of the Nazis' largest death camp. So the staging of Snow White itself took place in one of Birkenau's most unique spaces, the Theresienstadt family camp. Established in September of 1943, the first uh, transport of Jews from the Theresienstadt ghetto to the family camp arrived in Birkenau. So this was one of two family camps. The other one was established to house Roma and Sinti uh, deported to the Birkenau complex. But unlike the Roma family camp, the Nazi regime established the Theresienstadt family camp to serve as a potential propaganda site for welfare visits by the Red Cross, a sort of Potemkin village in what was done in, in similar fashion at the Theresienstadt ghetto. Upon arrival in Birkenau, child prisoners were not selected for the gas chambers. They kept their civilian clothing and they did not face the same brutal induction procedure that we often see in survivors' recollections at the camp. The only official marking differentiating prisoners of the family camp was a small notation of SB6 on their record, a shorthand for Sonderbehandlung 6, or Special Treatment 6. This Nazi euphemism denoted that family camp prisoners would be murdered six months after arrival, and that sort of becomes key in my discussion of resistance. So a little bit about the establishment of the school and how children came to be there in the first place. Czech Zionist leaders, those from the Theresienstadt ghetto who were deported in that September transport, received permission to establish a makeshift school known as the Children's Block shortly after their arrival in September of 1943. As in the Theresienstadt ghetto, fellow Jewish prisoners operated the school for children. In a 1965 interview, well-known child survivor and artist Yehuda Bakon recalls being taught about the French Revolution, both in Theresienstadt and Birkenau, with teachers drawn from the ranks of young Czech Zionist leaders. Most of these teachers were in their early to mid-20s. 
known as madrihim or guides, these instructors taught child prisoners a wide range of subjects from ancient history to modern mathematics. Their shared Zionism was a key guiding principle for children's education. Reflecting on his education in the family camp, John Freund, who was another child survivor, wrote that the Madrihim in the family camp taught him, quote, solidarity, self-reliance, and not to harm our fellow men, close quote. The late historian and family camp survivor Otto Dov Kolka endorses Freund's argument, claiming that his experiences from the children's block unquestionably form the moral basis for his approach to culture, to life, to almost everything. Thus, these educational programs took on a moral dimension in Birkenau, moving beyond academic knowledge to include what Madrihim defined as Zionist morals and values. Drawing on the memories of these child prisoners, I want to pre uh, present two related hypotheses tonight. The first one is that the children's block was just as much about child prisoners creating a space to express their perspectives on the absurdity of life in Birkenau as it was for adults to instill values into children, right? So there's the Madrihim's uh, goals and aims, and then there's what children used, how chil or I should say how children responded to those aims. This reality allows us to evaluate the role of children's games and jokes in providing child prisoners an outlet for expressing the realities of daily life in a death camp. Secondly, and perhaps more provocatively, I think while scholars have done much work to highlight the significant forms of spiritual resistance in Birkenau, the most sort of prominent of this being uh, Yehuda Bauer's Amidah, the drive to decenter the centrality of physical resistance in the camp complex, in my view, ironically belies the presence of such plans within the camp complex itself. Looking through children's memories, I found numerous examples of organized plans by Jewish groups in the family camp to retaliate physically against the SS. My position does not suggest that forms of spiritual resistance are of less value to Holocaust scholarship, but rather that if we look just below the surface, when we look at certain historical contingencies that happened, we can actually see significant examples of physical plots uh, to revolt. So back to Snow White. Uh, the sort of events around this staging are surprisingly well documented in survivor testimony. Numerous child survivors recall Freddie Hirsch, who, uh, the German-born Zionist youth educator in charge of the children's block, and his decision to commission 20-year-old Dina Gottliebova to paint the wall of the block with a landscape adorned with flowers and farm animals, the beginning of sort of a movie set. On the advice of the children, Gottliebova was about 20 years old at this time, she added Snow White and the Seven Dwarves. Child survivor Harry Krauss recalls the music and the plot and claim that they were adapted from the additional Disney movie with a few big differences. The play itself incorporated elements to satirize Jewish life in the family camp. Snow White and Birkenau mocked the SS and sought to provide comic relief to prisoners. The fact that child prisoners can make fun of the SS in this children's block demonstrates the exceptional nature of the family camp. Survivor Michael Honey writes in a letter to fellow survivors that one of their practice plays was interrupted by Fritz Buntrock, a notoriously harsh SS man stationed in the family camp. Buntrock sort of rushed into the family camp and screamed at the children saying that this play was not authorized and is quote, strictly forbidden. Freddie Hirsch responded in his perfect German that the commandant of Birkenau himself, Johann Schwarzhuber, had authorized the event. The layers of SS authority are clearly visible here, revealing a direct connection between what was going on in the children's block and SS administration in Birkenau. To further understand this complicated web of relations that children experience, we need to interrogate how the children's block came to exist in the first place. And here I really want to sort of drill down to the ground level of what's going on in Birkenau for children in the fall of 44. Child survivors recall that Hirsch appealed to SS leaders shortly after his arrival to establish a school where child prisoners could quote, understand the commands that were necessary for life in the camp. So the cover was that children don't understand what the SS are telling them to do, and thus we need to teach them those skills. Yehuda Bakon claimed that Hirsch's idea was seconded by Leo Janowitz, former secretary of the Theresienstadt Judenrat. Both Hirsch and Janowitz were prominent inmates from the Theresienstadt ghetto who were deported to the family camp in that first transport. 
In any case, the existence of this school was not covert. The SS approved its establishment and sanctioned its ex existence ostensibly for the purposes laid out by Hirsch. Camp authorities provisioned two block, or initially one block in the family camp, 31, uh, for the children's block. Uh, after the arrival of a second transport in December of 1943, block 29, which was the one located right, right next door, was turned into a second school. However, both were run as one unit under the guidance of Hirsch and young Zionist Madrichim. The physical structure of these barracks was identical to the rest of Bear Canal's uh, prefabricated horse stables with one specific modification. Instead of the iconic three-tiered bunks in most of Bear Canal's wooden barracks, prisoners placed wooden stools in the form of circles throughout the length of the barrack. These circles represented classes and children were organized by age. Young children sat closer to the entrance with older children sat closer to the back of the barrack. And this arrangement was replicated in block 31 as well. A reading of children's memories in the block reveals the presence of a surprising pattern, constant examples of play and what we would term morose humor as a coping mechanism in children's lives. Werner Reich recalled that quote, jokes kept us sane and that unlike food, Jokes worked very well to cope with the horrors of Birkenau. Yehuda Bakon endorses Reich's view. He claimed that when there was a lot of black smoke coming from the crematoria, children in the block would joke that fat Jewish people were being burned. Even on a discursive level, these jokes provided children with an outlet for the absurdity of their situation, permitting them to assimilate knowledge of murder into banal childhood coping mechanisms. Children's jokes also moved beyond the discursive level. Child survivor Jerry Steiner writes of a particularly morose game where children, quote, played gas chamber. Quote, they dug a hole, poured sand in it, and shouted, gas, gas, close quote. Steiner juxtaposes this memory with the qualification that just after playing this game, children also expressed their longing for home life. They made sand homes and gardens, fields and telegraph poles. They wanted to live. On one hand, Steiner's memory of young ch children imitating the gassing of fellow Jews demonstrates a complete immersion into the world of Birkenau. Yet his insistence that children also, quote, expressed their longing for life makes it clear that child prisoners in the family camp still held on to a semblance of the outside world. This finding endorses George Eisen's argument that rather than fully rejecting the outside world, children during the Holocaust maintained connections outside of camps and ghettos through a reliance on everyday games. Children in the family camp use such games to understand their new surroundings while simultaneously refashioning everyday childhood customs from their limited pre-camp lives. On one level, my analysis of children's education and play can be seen as an exceptional occurrence with little relation to the broader trends of Jewish day life in Birkenau. However, I want to suggest that the refashioning of children's ordinary lives should be viewed as an instance of cultural resistance at the center of the Nazi's largest death camp. The integration of Birkenau's purpose into children's lives represents a conscious attempt to come to terms with the extremity of the Nazi exterminationist project. When we examine questions of Jewish resistance from the perspective of child prisoners, we need to consider how children's particular roles as a perceived subaltern group, ironically granted them the ability to create discursive means to subvert Nazi aims of destroying Jewish communal life. So now on to sort of the second part of my argument here, what the one I think is a little bit more controversial. The connection between cultural and physical resistance in the family camp lies in an individual who has come to the forefront of scholarly literature on children's lives during the Holocaust, where previously mentioned, the 27-year-old Zionist youth leader named Freddie Hirsch. For the inmates of the family camp, Hirsch represented more than simply education and play at the heart of the family camp. The Zionist leader was seen as a key figure in Czech Jewish resistance networks. Hirsch's widespread popularity and respect from fellow prisoners provided him with a unique position to lead the largely Czech Jewish prisoner population. In the 1960s, Survivors recall constant visits of Kapos to the children's block, many of whom sought Hirsch's wisdom and guidance. Notably, during his first witness interrogation at the Frankfurt Auschwitz trials, Adolf Kolka recalled that Hirsch and his children's book barrack represented, quote, a center of planned resistance for the family camp, close quote. From this perspective, 
we can begin to examine how the children's block was more than a school, but also a central node for the planning of resistance efforts to stop the coming liquidations. So now we come to March 1944. And as I mentioned at the start, th this is when the Nazis plan to liquidate half of the family camp, everyone from the September transport, numbering just under 4,000 individuals. This included a significant percentage of children living in, in the children's blocks, as well as Zionist educators working there. Unknown to the SS at that time, resistance cells within the camp had learned of plans to murder the September transport and began to organize an uprising within the family camp. The hope of these Czech uh, Zionist resistance leaders was that with the support of the Zonderkommando, these actions would spark a general uprising within the larger Bear Canal complex. From the sources we have, resistance in the family camp was organized through three individual cells. First one was Freddie Hirsch in the children's block. The second one was Dr. Hanus Helman, who was head of the Kankenbau. And then the third one was the Czech Communist Resistance Organization. Given Hirsch's unquestioned leadership among Czech Jews in the family camp, he was seen as the natural leader for the uprising, and Hirsch was to give the signal to begin. Yet as history records, there was no uprising on March 7th. A few hours before the resistance was supposed to begin, Hirsch was found by fellow prisoners unconscious of an apparent drug overdose. Yet the circumstances surrounding the Zionist educator's death are not so clear. In a 2022 interview, Yehuda Bakon states that, quote, there are many versions of what happened. Indeed, as Kolka argues in his sole academic work on the family camp, questions surrounding Hirsch's death are one of the only universal aspects present in all family camp testimony. The image of Hirsch's suicide, especially as espoused by the post-war Czechoslovak state, appeared to be a cowardly act, undertaken to avoid any real resistance to Nazi aims. Yet there's a far more shocking explanation for Hirsch's death supported by post-war testimony. He was poisoned by fellow prisoners who sought to avert an uprising. This explanation first became popularized after a 1989 reunion of family camp survivors in Giva Chaim. In a letter to fellow survivor Jakob Sur, Michael Honey recalls that in, a middle, in the middle of a discussion on Hirsch's suicide, a surviving prisoner pharmacist named Ludwig Sand exclaimed, quote, what suicide? We gave him so many luminolettes that he should fall asleep, close quote. Sand's shocking statement shatters many survivors' pre-existing beliefs surrounding Hirsch's death. Assuming the notion that Hirsch committed suicide to avoid this physical act of resistance, Sand contends that he and prisoner doctors drugged Hirsch so that he could not lead a resistance to the liquidation. We will likely never know the precise circumstances surrounding that March day, but it is clear that Hirsch was faced with an impossible set of choices. As a prisoner functionary in the family camp, the SS offered him the chance to live and continue running the children's block. If Hirsch agreed, he would have betrayed the vast networks of prisoners in the camp who yearned for a physical revolt. On the other hand, any revolt would have likely failed and would have led to even further death. What we know is that on the morning of March 7th, these decisions gave Hirsch a severe headache. He was visited by Sand and Krankenbau head Hanus Helman, who provided Hirsch with treatment. What that treatment was is lost to history. So now some concluding thoughts. The lives of children in the family camp can provide historians of the Holocaust with a unique perspective into how resistance operated on both discursive and practical levels within what Peter Hayes has termed the capital of the Holocaust. My conclusion suggests that we do not need to look far to find examples of extensive resistance networks throughout the camp complex, but rather that these stories have been neglected due to the painful and potentially embarrassing conflicts which they invoke within survivor communities. A study of children's memories of camp life reveals sprawling networks of prisoners who sought to rebuke SS authority. Hirsch's children's block is just one example of this phenomenon. I want to conclude by returning to the staging of Snow White. While the integration of such leisure activities into the lives of child prisoners requires a different set of analytical tools than used to study overt acts of physical resistance, we should not treat the staging of this play as purely a means to shield children from the horrors of camp life. In their post-war memories, child survivors recall how this play drew resources from other Birkenau sectors, numerous prisoner functionaries, and even the SS. Far from a coping mechanism, the staging of Snow White was a clear act of social organization on the part of prisoners, many of them children. 
Thus, to study Jewish education in Birkenau, particularly through the eyes of children, requires us to refocus our perspective on how the most ordinary events in the camp form part of a far larger effort to assert Jewish communal life, even in the most unimaginable of circumstances. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jonathan, for this presentation. Wow, what an interesting meeting. Um, now we've got some time for um, the discussion, about 20 minutes, and we will finish our meeting 10 past eight. Um, if you have more questions, please put them into the chat. Um, Professor Gruner, uh, I see that the audience is very grateful for your presentation. And uh, I see also some uh, questions in the chat for you. Uh, the first question is, is it what is it was collaboration, was it collaboration between German Jews resistors to local anti-fascist movement as Communist Party of Germany or Ernst Thälmann? Mm. I'm not sure. I think, okay. Should I respond? Yeah. Of course. Yeah, I think this is about uh, where there are ties between, let's say, Jews and the communist resistance. And uh, first of all, in general, we have uh, only estimates, but there is an estimate of 3,000 Jewish men and women who had ties to uh, the communist resistance in uh, Germany. But one of my cases actually also illustrates this, uh, which I uh, didn't uh, get into, uh, the part about physical uh, self-defense uh, uh, the main story is of a 16-year-old girl from Berlin uh, who is um, caught in a raid uh, of her retraining camp uh, in uh, Western Germany. And she defends herself against uh, a physical assault by a stormtrooper. Uh, and um, she can only do this because she had uh, some self-defense training in her Hashu Merhatzer group in Berlin uh, when she was like 12, 13, 14 years old. Uh, and this group, she uh, explains in her testimony for the Shoah Foundation, had ties to the communist uh, uh, resistance. And uh, they, uh, for, uh, she describes in her interview that she, uh, uh, in a way, functioned as a kind of information collector for, uh, with, uh, for information which was then transferred to the communist uh, resistance. So there are ties. Uh, I'm not going so much into this into my book because I'm focusing very much on the individual. But at the end, in my conclusion, I point out that no individual exists in a vacuum. They have always ties to family, friends, and uh, then also to group settings. And so I think this is kind of a thing we need to explore more in the future. Thank you. The first question was, was from Shmuel. And now we move to Adriana's question. Um, she's curious, uh, did you include the resistance? Of... Ask a few questions together, okay? Okay. Uh, so, uh, did you include the resistance of intermarried German Jews? Another question to you, for you. Are all the examples personal actions of, or do we see people working together? And um, another question. Can you give us a window into researching by telling us how you rescued the story of the fire alarm puller? I think three okay. questions. Enough. Yeah, very, very quickly. I focused on so-called full Jews. However, one of my main story is actually uh, the woman who uh, critiqued Kristallnacht, the November program. She is living in an intermarriage. So she's one of the examples. But most of my examples, Practically 99% of my examples are not from intermarriages, but are from kind of uh, Jewish individuals, because I didn't want to um, come into this problem that uh, intermarriages had certain uh, uh, sometimes more favorable conditions. And uh, so I wanted to really focus on the individual resistance against uh, the full blown persecution. Um, about the networks and the groups, I already pointed out that uh, that we have to follow these ties more in the future. And then, um, what was the last question? The 
the first one, I think. Oh, uh, no, no, I, now I remember. It's oh, no, about the no, story no. of about the Hans fire alarm puller. Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah. If you could uh, give us a window into researching by telling us how you uh, rescued the story. Yeah, so this is uh, uh, part of how my research evolved because the first traces uh, were all public protest. Uh, and they were kind of, uh, I found them in police records and sometimes court records. And then the more I dove into kind of this public critique, this oral protest, I realized that court records also often contained other uh, instances of resistance. And so when I went to the main state archive in Wiesbaden, this is one of the best organized uh, archives in Germany. They have uh, uh, already kind of very fine kind of tables uh, about their records. So it was very easy for me to find instances of resistance uh, of Jews who were kind of uh, arrested and then put on trial in courts. So that's how I kind of found with it, with many other kind of trials against Jews for very for a variety of reasons. Uh, I found this uh, case, and then I, uh, uh, in a way, I, it was such an interesting story that I made it to one of my chapters uh, by really uh, doing a deep dive in the uh, research. I found his prison records. There were these letters and so on. Thank you. And uh, now I will jump to. Uh, Dr. Franzacki and ask two questions. Uh, do you know if there are numbers of Jews who in fact did not show up for deportation? Another question, what percentage of uh, those who um, managed to escape were women? And maybe another uh, question about the jumpers. Um, you said that many of the jumpers were foreign Jews. Is it about them being aliens or is it because they were communists? Um, okay, thank you for the questions. Um, I start with the first one. Um, I don't know, uh, I, I never came across uh, numbers on how many people did not show up, but of course I came across many um, examples or stories in my research that it was um, um, massive um, practice of resistance to not to show up and to go into hiding. Um, the second, I can say exactly what percentage of those who managed to escape were women. For the three countries I did research on, it was 14% altogether. So, yeah. Um, the last question, I'm not really sure if I get it um, from Boas. Okay, um, so many jumpers were foreign Jews. Yes. You so. I mean, you and, talked and, about and, jumpers being non-citizens. Non yeah. I'm asking, is it the fact that they were non-citizens mm -hmm. and not a part of the community? Or is it because they were activists in uh, communist groups? Mm -hmm. Are we talking about mm -hmm. generally non-citizens or communists? Yeah, um, I think it's uh, it can be both and it can be separate. There are cases um, that um, people were in these groups that I mentioned partly and um, uh, others acted alone. And um, I think that um, they all, many of them had the experience of uh, persecution in the countries of origin already. So they were more ready to to um, to try to escape than other uh, than the um, Jewish uh, Jewish population in the Netherlands that was long assimilated. Hardly no foreigners coming. And in Belgium, for instance, um, a lot of Jews wanted to go to to the U.S. Uh, through the through the harbor uh, of Antwerp, and um, so um, they um, yeah they were ready to to escape in a way. Uh, whether they were communists or not, uh, because um, they were, they had many, had made so many efforts to save their lives and to search for something better. Um, I think this was um, a force for, that was driving people. At, at Regina, can yes. I add something to the first question to Tanya uh, about the people not showing up uh, for deportations? Of course. 
uh, just from, from my research in Germany, uh, so most what we understand of hiding in Nazi Germany is actually not showing up for deportations. So this, uh, the kind of the peak of uh, uh, the hiding is when the deportation starts and then uh, when uh, the mass deportations in the fall 1942 and especially 1943 with the factory action. So for Berlin, we, ha we practically have estimates that uh, 4,000 out of 11,000 people did not show up for the deportation. So that's kind of very common. And uh, what we understand of hiding is practically not this. And then I would just want to add, we also need to think about those who are deported, not always kind of also stayed there. So I found cases in Austria where people came back from Warsaw, from the Warsaw ghetto, who escaped there after the deportation, after they were deported, and then went back to Austria, to Vienna. Thank you, Professor, for your remark. And last question is for you. Uh, can you say more about your choice to organize your book around the five types of resistance? And can you share more about the individual acts of resistance that did not leave traces in the local archives and you were able to explore them? Some examples? Um, yeah, so I needed to kind of have some measure or kind of some way to organize these hundreds and hundreds of different cases. And uh, uh, because they were so different and uh, so I needed to find uh, some structure. And this is how I came up with these five different types of resistance, which more or less could fu function as an uh, umbrella to get most of the cases uh, in, in within these uh, five different types. And the ones who um, did not, or where we don't have traces, how I came about those in the Shaw Foundation, for example, people tell stories and we talked about this earlier that people, how they, the survivors actually perceive uh, their acts if this was resistance or not. In my case, um, most of them do not because they think about resistance as armed resistance, but they tell stories of kind of, uh, what their mothers or their fathers did, or sometimes they themselves. And one story is that um, uh, a son uh, talks about that, the, uh, that they lost their shop, but they still lived uh, in the same house. And the new, the kind of Aryan owner of the shop put a sign on the door for Jews forbidden. And uh, the mother of this, of this uh, boy, uh, one night crossed out the the, uh, uh, the uh, one letter which made it for everybody forbidden. Yeah. So afterwards there was an interrogation, an investigation, and uh, the mother didn't tell something. Nobody knew who did this, and so they got away with it. Thank you very much. Uh, I don't see any more questions in the chat. Um, so at this point, I'd like to thank once again, Professor Gruner and our uh, panelists, uh, Jonathan Lanz and uh, Dr. Fran Zaki. And um, we have learned a lot about forms of courage that ordinary Jews performed during the Holocaust, acts of courage that we recognize now, like acts of extraordinary resistance. It's time for final remarks. And Buzz, the floor is yours. And you are muted. Uh, sorry, is it my turn? I didn't get it. No. Whose turn is it? Mine. OK. Uh... So just to conclude, I think we can see that uh, some issues uh, go uh, join all the presentations. We have the issue of tension, a tension between the people who are activists and the people who are afraid of this activism between in the Jewish community. If we talk about the jumpers, it was very strong. Uh, we always hear about those people who are jumping. Uh, the story, this is uh, uh, the stories we hear about, but we uh, don't hear much about arguments like we heard from you. 
uh, from from, uh, from Tan, uh, Dr. Fonsetti. And I think this is very important that we, we David, there is understanding that there is a price for resistance. Now we know this about armed resistance. We know that one of the things holding up armed resistance was the issue of a solidarity of responsibility for the community. Now we see also when we talk about a personal survival and the a other acts like the children's bark and Hirsch, we see that the actually the issue of solidarity or the issue of responsibility, sorry, for those who are not a part of the this resistance is very important. And there is a tension, and some people are holding their leg and saying, no, we will pay the price. And it's it's interesting that uh, maybe 50 years ago, uh, a, a rabbi in Israel, an educator, wrote a, a response on jumping, on, on escaping from a, it was a Rav Neria, and he was writing about escaping from a, a, the, the, the moral and halachic issues of escaping from a concentration camp, knowingly, knowing that people will pay a price for every escapee. So do, are you allowed to escape if you know that other people are going to pay the price? Are you allowed, we, we can ask about Tanya as an example. Are you allowed to jump the train if other people are going to pay the price? So these issues are actually, we knew them about uh, the underground and uh, the resistance. And we now see that they permitted the whole, uh, the whole, uh, kaleidoscope, the whole puzzle of Jewish experience. I will also say that uh, I wrote my MA on this issue of the changing perceptions from a resistance to what we call in Hebrew amida, or what I translated as a steadfastness. Uh, all sorts of other resistance. Actually, the person who brought this uh, was not Bauer, but, uh, but Max Bozvetsky. We started with Wojcicki uh, in uh, the opening words by Verena. Uh, maybe we'll end with him. He wrote. He spoke in 1967 on uh, 68 in the uh, first. Uh, he organized and spoke in a conference in Jerusalem about Jewish Amida, a big conference in Yad Vashem. So it is not something new that we know there are other types of resistance. But what we learned from the three presentations here that the uh, scope, the spectrum is much bigger, uh, is growing more and more. We can add more and more uh, phenomena that we did not know about into this big story that was discussed from the 50s and 60s and is now a research done today is opening new avenues to understand it. So thank you very much to our speakers. Thank you very much for Verena who did the hard work uh, of uh, organizing this uh, event and the next ones. I will also tell you that uh, next month we'll put up a notice uh, next week that we are going to have a different type of event and we are starting a series about a, a Holocaust scholars, the people behind the books. And the first one will be an interview of Professor Dan Michman by Professor uh, Malin Torturbi. And it will about the way he came to Holocaust, the personal story of the historian. And this is something we'll uh, put between the seminars and the conferences, we'll put this new series of uh, getting to know the people behind the books. So thank you very much. Thank you to, to our speakers. Thank you again, uh, Verena. And uh, looking forward to meet you on and be in touch with us. Don't be strangers if you're in Israel, always uh, be uh, tell us you're here. And uh, the web enables us to meet each other even without flying anywhere. So uh, we are always looking for more cooperation, more new ideas. So thank you very much and uh, have a good night.
Thank you. I did not. Uh, Katarzyna Gabowska, I did not thank. I, I am sorry. Uh, we had a chair. Uh, we uh, also thank you for chairing and organizing the Korean A. I'm, I'm, I apologize for missing that. Thank you for organizing the event. It was fantastic, really. And I'm yeah, not I agree. telling that I agree that's you. because I was the moderator. <laughs> yes, thank you.